We're going to pretty much get going right from where we left off on Friday. Three announcements before we get started though. The midterms are finished grading. I'm just finalizing the grades, grading the 80%, 20% from the collaborative part. So I'll post those grades on Avenue and have them returned to you on Wednesday here at the class. I will only hand the exams back at, in person to the person whose name is on the paper and at class only. So that's on Wednesday morning, I'll do that. Um, the solutions will be posted online also later this week. I'm just busy typing them up for my handwritten version. Assignment 4 is posted as opposed to be a scene we've started to work on that already. Assignment 4 is an important short, very short one question assignment that covers all the work we did last week and in particular if you're comfortable with using the math lab software similar. So I demoed that last week Friday. Hope you've had a chance to review that video if you didn't make Friday's class. Simulink is an important part of this course and a good tool to learn to use to simulate control systems. So that's what assignment four is about. And then lastly, there's no tutorial this morning uh, for the Monday morning group that's been posted for a while. That's so that there's an equal balance of Monday and Friday tutorials between the two groups. So no tutorial this Monday, but there will be a tutorial on Friday this morning to balance out. Okay, any questions on that? Nothing just yet. When is that <coughs> so when is the signing for you? It's a Friday. Any, any okay, so let's uh, let's resume right back where we were on Friday last week, as well as the all the week prior to that. We were considering the feedback control group. If there's anything you will remember permanently from this course as you move through your career, it's the material we covered last week before reading week, as well as the material we're covering this week. I'll argue that those are the most important topics in process control are being covered right now, which is why it's a good time in reading week for you to put up on the material we studied and during the midterm, and then going forward, you have to have to keep up with this course. This course is actually really nicely spaced that there's the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, giving you the Tuesday and Thursday to catch up. Please make use of that. Don't fall behind by even a single class with this course because the way I've structured it is, is it's extremely cumulative. But you'll also notice that what I do very frequently in my teaching is I use what's in, called interleaving. Interleaving is a topic we learn about in psychology and learning how the brain works shows that interleaving is a spectacular way to remember topics. And what I mean by that is you'll often see me recap topics we've just covered the second time and the third time. So let's do that. Let's take a look at what we were covering last week and, and use this concept of interleaving. We saw last time we developed a block diagram between an output, the control variable, and the set point change. So let's recall what that means in the diagram that is where the number is on the We developed this feedback control mechanism where we've got, well, let's grab some of the process here, GP, and there's my control variable. And what I do is I measure that control variable, feed it back over here, and compare it to the set point where I would like to be. So this is where I actually am, my control variable, set point is where I would like to be. And we said last time, we'll subtract those and form the error. That error then gets fed into my controller. We'll call my controller GC. So GC is a Laplace function, and GP is a Laplace function in my process. So this GP represents reality. It may not match reality perfectly, but GC is what I actually implement in a computer based system. So my computer will accept the set point, will accept the measurement CV, do the subtraction, calculate an error, then do something related to that error to output a change that I'm going to make in my process, the manipulated variable. And so we covered this intensively last time. So this is the part that we're going to be focusing on. We did it last week, Friday, and the next few classes is GC. This is the guy that we have control over. We can adjust the settings in GC. And by adjusting those settings in GC, we can get what we would like to see out here. 
So as the engineer on the process, your responsibility is going to be changing the settings in GC. And you're going to see by the end of this video, there's three numbers in there that you can change. So you have to know what those numbers mean, and if you increase them or decrease them, what's going to happen. So that's where we're going with this. And what we did last class, in fact, is we saw the most basic form of GC, where GC is simply just a constant. Okay, so what we did last week is we derived a control where GC is simply a constant called KC. And that we call proportional control. And the reason for that name is because the output MV is going to be proportional to the input of the error. So recall what GC is doing. <coughs> GC is a transfer function, but if you get to write GC back in the time domain, what it's essentially doing is it's telling me my manipulated variable MV is simply a constant KC times zero. That's in the time domain. You take the Laplace transform of that the manipulated variable divided by. And so we spent two, three classes last week discussing what that's all about and why that works really well. Okay, we also learned some important things last time that the units of GC, GC actually has units because it converts an error to a manipulated variable. So it has units of the manipulated variable units <coughs> divided by the control variables. And those will be different in different processes. Oh, we're not going to deal with primes anymore. We're assuming everything is always in deviation. So as I said last time, from now on and onwards, everything is always in deviation. So, yeah, so we actually will drop the primes from our notation. So that was the most basic form of control. That's your first parameter that you can adjust in that controller is the proportional constant called KC. But we learned last Friday and Wednesday that that's really not a good controller. If you only had that single number to adjust and that only that form of controller, you wouldn't actually do a very good job. In fact, that controller doesn't really achieve your set point. We proved that last time, we won't go through it, but what we will show write down at least as a note to ourselves is that E of S never gets to zero. And that's not a good controller. If you cannot get that error over there down to zero, it implies that you can never achieve a set point. That's no good, right? We don't want a control system that says, I want 25 degrees Celsius, but you cannot actually ever achieve that. So we proved that last, last time. And you can use the final value theorem to do that. So in other words, we said the limit of E of t as t tends to infinity, that's the same thing as using the limit as s times E of s as s tends to zero. And that is not equal to zero. Another way that you'll say this, using technical jargon, is we cannot achieve offset-free control. So let's take a look at what we mean by the word offset. Offset means we cannot achieve our set point. So another way we showed it last time that that works is Let's do a look at it diagrammatically. Let's consider the following situation. We showed this in simulating last, last week. But if I had to plot the set point as a function of time, and consider a set point change occurring at some time after zero. So we make a change to our process to the set point in the time domain. Now, 
that's the set point. And what we showed last time is our control variable. That's the guy we're really interested in, in getting to the set point. Well, it won't actually get to set point. So let's say my control variable starts at the same point. We proved last time that the control variable will actually have a response like that. <coughs> happen is your control variable won't actually achieve set point. So that offset or that amount that you're away from the set point, we call that our offset. And a good controller will obviously have a zero offset or a zero error. Okay? Another way you can see this, take these two curves, SP over here, and CV here in the second one, you can easily calculate what that error would have looked like. If I plot error as a function of time, what's it going to look like? Sorry, so I have a question about the <coughs> second one. Yeah. What well, you're asking to like approach your no. set point? It's flat line and will remain flat line with a deviation away from set point. We proved that last time. And your error would uh, go down, but never approach zero. Okay, never approach zero, so that's here at the end. What does it do initially? Stop time. Okay, so let's start. Where do, where do I start? Error is at zero initially. Okay. Then, flat line for a while, for the same distance. Then a sudden spike. <coughs> and then it comes down, but never achieves zero. Okay, that's the key part. You don't get to zero. Yes. If the offset is constant, can we just set a lower set point or a higher set point or something to go? Okay, yeah. <laughs> You're thinking nicely. I like that. So if the offset's constant, why don't you just change your set point so that you actually get to the other set point that you would have ultimately yeah. achieved. Okay, we, we could do that, but then what you'll see is you have to have then a table of different set points for when, when you want to control the different variables. So your control system now becomes a lot more complicated. Our goal is then to try and get this automatically so you can set this control and it will just go ahead and do its own thing. Okay. So this will remain constant and keep perpetuating. So you'll never get an error down to zero. Okay. And what we also did last class is we showed what's going to happen to this curve here. Remember, this is our ultimate goal of why we're controlling. We want this control variable to be close to the set point. And we showed last time what's going to happen to that curve if I change KC. Remember, KC is the number that you as the engineer can adjust. So if you make KC higher, so make it a larger positive value, what's going to happen to that curve? <laughs> Anyone recall? Sharper? Sharper in which way? Positive to the y-axis. So if KC is a higher number, that curve rises a lot faster. We say you get more aggressive control but you will still not achieve a zero offset. You can make KC higher and higher and higher, you will never get to have offset free control. You simply get closer to it, but you won't achieve it, and you get a far more aggressive control. If KC is smaller, you'll get the opposite case, but where this is a more sluggish response, and you will still get offset. This is small KC, and this is large KC. Okay, so that's, that's some important learning we, we did last class. And very easy to prove this to yourself using the simulating tool. I'd like you and I'd encourage you to go play around with it. Create a control loop, adjust KC values, Make them positive, make them negative. We in fact did that last time. Showed what happens if you have a negative KC. 
play around with the software because this is a really quick and easy way to learn and confirm your understanding. So let's take this a step further now and introduce the topic that I'd like to discuss today that's new, and that's we're going to improve this controller to achieve offset-free control. That's our goal. Okay, so let's uh, <coughs> we'll call this topic integral control. Have you all heard about PID controllers? We look at the P part, the proportional part, we're going to look at the I part, the integral portion. So PID control, and then later this week we'll look at the D part, the derivative. So we looked at the proportional, now the integral. So the integral part says we would like E of T to tend to zero. I would like that error to disappear, have no offset as t tends to infinity. So, here's the thinking. Notice we said last, last time that this error perpetuates. This error keeps going and going. What if, as long as the error is non-zero, I take action on my process. I give an additional input to the manipulated variable so that until that error is zero, I'm going to keep adding something to my process to make the error disappear. <coughs> so that's the thinking. And one way you can say that the error is non-zero is to simply integrate the area under the curve. So as long as this integral under the curve is non-zero, keep taking action until you get the zero area under the curve. So, integrate the area under the E of T curve. And supply an input to the process. So, in other words, what that means we're going to keep adjusting the manipulated variable, adjust the input to the process NV, until that area is zero. So that's the thinking behind the integral mode of the controller. process until that area is zero. I'm going to add, in addition to what I'm already adding, I'm going to add a little bit more to drive that error down to zero. And if we quantify that numerically, we're going to use exactly this definition. Like the area under the curve to be zero, well, that says integrate from zero to some time t. Now this is the same t over here over there. So that T there is that T over there. So integrate the area. Now the error is a function of time. But what we do is just to avoid confusion between this time and that time over there. We call this T star. T star. An integral is always with respect to a variable. This variable is time here 
this error. So we're going to integrate that area, area under the error curve. And we're going to take an action that's proportional to that integral. So we're not just going to take the area and make that a manipulated variable. I'm going to modify this by some constant and take an action proportional to the error. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing here. So the integral at least up to this point will be zero. So we just simply integrate from time zero onwards. Well, we, st we always start at time zero. It doesn't matter if this is zero here. It's just we'll integrate and that part will be zero. But then the moment this kicks in, we're going to start integrating this error here as well. Okay. So we simply integrate from time zero our reference time. So let's take an action yeah. proportional to this error. By convenience, or by convention, I should say, we will use kc here again. Then we'll divide you by this variable called ti. This is your second parameter that you can adjust. So kc is your first parameter that you can adjust. There's your second parameter. So ti is what we call our integral time. There's a reason why it's a time, it has units of time. Ti is your integral time. Some books you'll see this called tau i. So it's a even split between the two notations. So I'll sometimes use both because when I learned this in undergrad, I used tau i, but I didn't use Dr. Marlin's book. Dr. Marlin's book uses ti, but sometimes you might simply write tau i just by mistake. Try to speak to ti. Ti has units of time. Okay, and also ti specify as a positive value. Now comes the fun step. How do we take the Laplace transform of this? It was easy when it was the, just the first part, nv is equal to kc times e. Why, why are these are in Okay, T star is referring to this term over here. You're going to see now when we do the last transform, there's two T's. There's this T referring to this error function on its own. And so to distinguish this integral as a function of T star versus this time, which is our time domain time, we use different notation. You'll see why now, because when you do the last transform of this, Let's take a look at the Laplace transform of the integral from 0 to some time t. That's my Laplace transform. Recall the Laplace transform is defined as the integral from 0 to infinity of the function that's inside this curly braces. Well, the function that's inside the curly braces is an integral itself from 0 to t, e to the t star, e t star, okay, and then we multiply by e to the minus s t e t. Now you can see why I've got t star and t. The t, the regular t over here, refers to this Laplace transform. T star then is just simply because I'm integrating a function that is itself a function of time. So we want to just make, make that clear that there's a difference. Now I will spare you the details. It's two lines of integration by parts on page 102 of Marlin. If you want to see the, the next two three steps, they're just simply messy algebra. No need to do that to understand what's going on here. 
the result is that that Laplace transform is 1 over s to the s. So there's a bit of simplification after you do the integration by parts. And you can see all those details on page 102 of Dr. Marmot. Here again, as I said before, I, I recognize that you guys all have the book, you can all read. There's no point in spending class time in deriving those derivations. So if we use that knowledge now, we can then take the Laplace transform here of this time domain function. And we get a fairly nice result, mv of s is equal to kc times e of s plus kc over ti. And then we've just shown that what the Laplace transform of that integral is. Well, that's 1 over s times e of s. So notice that there's an E of S term over here that we can factor out. So we can write this as a transfer function now, in fact. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get this GC of S, where my input is an error, and my output is the manipulated variable want to transfer function for that control, controller now, and that's actually here given up quite nicely to us in this transfer function form, that mv of s over e of s is equal to kc plus kc over ti times 1 over s. So just factoring out the e of s and bringing it over to the left side. Recall back a few classes ago, a few weeks ago, what happens when we've got two units that are added together? What does that look like on a block diagram? <coughs> We're comfortable with two units that are in series. We multiply them. So they're in parallel on the block diagram. They're in parallel on the block diagram. So a block diagram in single link, if you want to do this in single link now, you could take your E of S and you split it into two parts. One part that's KC and another part that's KC over TI times 1 over S. So they're in parallel and then you can add them to plus and plus. I'm sorry, I've run out of space there a bit. So you add those two units, those two signals, add it back together again to get your output. That's a quick way to simulate that PI controller, proportional plus integral controller simulator, to recognize that they're in parallel on the block diagram. But let's start a little slower. Let's in fact just consider a case where we've got only an integral controller. Now this is not something we normally do. I'll emphasize this. We don't ever implement a controller that's simply just an integral controller on its own. We always have the proportional plus integral part. But just to understand what the integral part is doing, let's consider a feedback controller where there's only an integral part. Simulate it in Simulink, see what happens, make sure we understand. So I'll stop it 
where we were on Friday. Okay, so on Friday's class, we ended off with this block diagram. Let's take a look at what it was. We were considering a process in the simulation where my process GP was a first order process with a gain of 3 and a time constant of 2. So that was my process on Friday. And we considered a controller where we've simply got a simple proportional only controller. And we were making a step input. That step input was a step at time 2. And we were making a unit magnitude step. So in other words, in the time domain, that step was 0. And then at time 2, we are making a single unit step in the second. So that was my input, and remember what we said is my output was going to look like the first order transfer function. So if we simulate that, that output looks like the first order process, but notice we never actually achieved our one. We were aiming for a one as my output, so my step change was from zero to one, but my output here, the control variable, I start at time 2, I achieve a first order response, but I never make it all the way up to 1. Let's take a look at the error signal. The error signal matches exactly what we had up here on the board earlier. We've got zero error up to time 2, then we have an error peak at 1, and we drop down, but we never actually get that error down to 0. So that was our proportional only controller. Let's take a look at what an integral controller does. So, in other words, what I'm considering from the block diagram perspective for now is what is a controller that only has that sort of shape? Okay, so consider an integral controller. So GC is KC over TI times 1 over S. And for convenience for the simulation, just so that we understand what TI is doing, let's consider the case where KC is 1. So just a very simple controller with simply 1 over TI and then a 1 over S is my integrator. So how do we get that integrator in MATLAB? Well, take this over here to the side. And what we do is go to the continuous section, and in the continuous section there's an integrator term. You can drag that integrator into your simulation and replace it where we want it, over there. <coughs> now, notice that the numerator of the integrator is 1. If you double click on this block, you cannot change the numerator of the integrator. So that term is 1 over s, you can't really do anything with it. We need a KC over tau i, or TI in front of it. Okay, so that's why I left this multiplier that block over here. Because that's going to be my KC over TI. So let's just change this over here. 1 divided by something. So I'm going to enter that as my 1 over something. KC is 1, TI. So let's start with the base case of TI equal to just 20. There we go. We don't know what's going to happen. Let's see what happens. So KC is 1, TI is 20. There's my integrator. What do we expect to see happen down the scope? The output. Based on this derivation of what we've just covered, what do we expect to see? Maybe you get closer to, to 1, whatever. Get closer to 1? Yeah. <laughs> Should we achieve 1? Longer time to get there? Okay, let's take a look. We don't really know. We've got nothing to go on. Let's simulate it and take a look. So there's a simulation for 10, 10 minutes. <coughs> Not too much happened. Um, it started to rise up, but we obviously haven't simulated long enough. So let's simulate for a little bit longer. Let's maybe go to 30 minutes. So half an hour of simulation. Run that. Take a look at the scope.
<laughs> How's that for a control controller? It takes too long. Okay, so it's taking, we're stepping at time two and we get to the set point at about time 22. So we're taking about 20 minutes to achieve our set point now. Okay, so it's taking too long, that's right. But we're achieving our set point. And so this is great. We've made a big, big step here in terms of achieving our goal of getting to the target. What's going to happen now if I change TI? If I were to set to the set point, it changes based on what TI is. Okay. Which way is it going to change? Can you decrease it until we go, so it's going to go quicker. Okay, so at least Alex is fast this morning. <laughs> So let's see, how did Alex get to that conclusion? You said decrease TI and you get to the set point faster. Yeah. Everyone see that? Yeah. So consider that integral again, zero to T e to the, so we're integrating the error. We've got KC divided by TI in front of it. Okay. So this is, my manipulated variable as a function of time. That block that I have here in the simulation, remember this simulation is in the Laplace domain, as I explained Friday, all that MATLAB is doing here is it's helping you go from the Laplace domain back to the time domain. So you don't have to do that step anymore. Simulink does it. So these two blocks together that I've highlighted over here, they're doing all that work for you. That's essentially say in the last transform notation what this is over here. Okay. So if I decrease TI, if I make TI, well let's go up. No decrease, yeah, let's decrease TI. We've got 20 at the moment here. So if I make TI smaller, let's say I go to five, what are, what's going to happen to the manipulated variable? Reach that point quicker. It's going to reach that point quicker. In other words, what it's going to do is it's going to integrate this error, and whatever that area is under the curve, currently it's dividing it by 20. What it's going to do now instead is it's going to divide it by 5. So, in other words, manipulated variable is going to be larger. It's going to take what we say a more aggressive action. It's going to take a more drastic or aggressive action. So before I simulate that, let's just update this text here. So that's Kc divided by Ti. Let's take a look at what that manipulated variable currently is. Currently we're using Ti of 20. That manipulated variable looks as follows. So it's changing at time 2, making a gentle increase. And about time 22, it's reaching a value of about 0.33. So that's the current shape of that manipulated room. Let's take a look now if I change this to 1 divided by 5. So I'm decreasing TI. Simulate that again. Now let's take a look at that. What's happened there? So TI being lowered means we're going to then take that error, that integral area under the curve, and instead of dividing it by 20, we're dividing it by 5, a smaller number. So we're not, if we, when we were dividing it by 20, we were dividing by a bigger number, so we were discounting the area a bit more and taking slower action. Now we're taking faster action because we're dividing through by a smaller <coughs> TI. And in fact, we're taking faster action. We're taking action so fast that in fact we go higher than what we need to, and we have to back away. This is like someone on the gas pedal wanting to reach 100 kilometers an hour. They overgas the car, they exceed their target, and then they have to lift off the gas pedal because they exceeded where they needed to be. And so you've taken 
too much action and then you have to back away. Let's take a look at what the output is doing. So that scope there. Remember previously it took, we stepped at time 2 and it took all the way up to 22 to reach target. What we've done now in fact is we've exceeded target and we're, we're oscillating a little bit around it. Okay, so what should I use for TI maybe? Let's try 10. All right, so 20 was, was not fast enough. I'm just looking for my razor here. So 20 was not fast enough. TI equal to 5 was, we'll use this word overshoot, we overshot where we wanted to be and then we had to oscillate a little bit and back off. So let's try something here in the middle. TI equals 10. So 1 divided by 10 and simulate that now. Okay, let's take a look at the output. Got a little bit less overshoots. Okay, and I reach my target a little bit earlier. These are the two numbers that you can adjust. Tau I and we're going to, I'm going to add back A Singapore for you in a minute. Okay, but is everyone clear what Tau I or TI is doing here? TI is simply weighting that area under the error curve. Let's take a look, in fact, at what the error is doing. What do you expect the error curve to look like? At least, what's one characteristic of the error curve? Before I show it to you, what do you expect to see there? Spike up. Okay. So it's going to spike up, everyone agrees. And then, what is the final value of error going to be? Zero. There's going to be a little bit of oscillation there. So let's take a look at error. So there's that spike up, as we expect. And notice that error ends up being zero. So we actually do achieve our goal here of offset free control. But notice. If you remember when we had the proportional only controller, we got to set point, well, we didn't get to set point, remember, but we got up pretty fast, right? We've lost that ability. We've lost that ability of getting close to our target quickly. The integral controller is getting us to target eventually, but it's not getting us there quickly. And why is that? Well, here's the answer why it's why that's the case. Because the integral controller is simply taking the area under this curve and integrating it. So let's take a look at integral initially is 0, 0, 0. Then I suddenly see the spike. Let's take time 2.1. The area under that curve is a long sliver. Okay. So I'm going to take a small amount of action because that area is not big yet. It's tall, but it's thin. Then as I move over in time, that area gets a little bit more and a little bit more as I keep going. So what's happening here, this controller, it will take action, but it's going to take a while for that error to build up for the action to take effect. Okay? So the integral controller is good at getting us offset free, but it's not good at getting us offset free quickly. And that's why I said we will never actually implement a controller with just the integral mode. We will always have the proportional mode as well. So let's go back here. We will always implement our controller with KC, the proportional mode, plus the integral mode. So how do we do that? Well, we can, we can do that quite easily in Simulink. I will pull out and open the file where I've done that already because it's not, we'll just take you two, three minutes to set it up, but it's not hard. Here's what you do. So there's your 
proportional mode in parallel to your integrator. Okay, everyone clear why this is the case? Because we've got two transfer functions that are summed up, those are represented in the block diagram as two blocks in parallel. So take your error, your error splits over here, you send the same value goes to this proportional mode, the same value goes to the integral mode, the integral part. Then we combine them with two pluses, and then that becomes your manipulated variable. So let's go back to our base case. Kc is equal to 1. So let's change this. Kc is equal to 1. Let's go 1 divided by 5. So there's Kc is equal to 1 and Ti is equal to 5. So we expect to get offset free control and we expect to get to the set point really quickly. Let's see what happens. <coughs> so remember it took 22 time units, 20, 22 minutes previously with just the integral mode. Let's take a look now. What's going on happen though? That makes sense. Okay, so here's a suggestion. We still need to work on those two numbers and find a good setting to get to target in a desirable way. And that's absolutely what our goal is going to be in the coming weeks. We're going to learn how to set KC and TI, not so to plug and chug, but we're going to do a bit of plug and chug and fine tuning. But now we actually know what's going to happen. What's going to happen if I increase, sorry, if I decrease TI? So TI currently is, is 5. What's going to happen if I decrease TI? Are you going to get there faster or slower? Okay, that's what I need. So let's go 1 over 2. Let's simulate that again. Wow. Okay. Now we get the best of both worlds. With a small change in TI, here's my step at two, I get to my target within three minutes. Okay, and offset free, there's zero, zero offset. But look at my error. My error is over there. It peaks up and then drops back down to zero. So this is where we're going. Now, there's actually an even better way we can the process by adding the derivative mode. The derivative mode anticipates what you're going to do in the future. Okay? So we're going to see that on Wednesday. 